If you've ever felt like your brain is a tug of war, part of you chasing novelty and noise, while another part begs for quiet and predictability, you're not broken. You might just be ADHD. Today, we're going to zoom inside the ADHD brain, the networks that manage attention and sensory input the chemicals that set our energy and focus, and the genes that stack the deck so these traits often travel together. I'll show what's shared, what's different, and how to use this knowledge to make daily life kinder on your nervous system. Hi, I'm Jess, that ADHD mum, helping you understand your neurodivergent brain. If this is your thing, hit subscribe so you don't miss the next deep dive. So here's the roadmap for today. First, it's what ADHD actually means. And then it's onto the brain networks and the triple network dynamics. Next, we'll dive into neurochemistry and the EI balance. Then it's onto genetics. And lastly, what this explains in everyday life and what you can do next. So what is ADHD? ADHD is simply autism and ADHD showing up in the same person. We used to treat these as either or, because all the manuals didn't allow for a dual diagnosis. But that changed with the DSM-5 in 2013, which recognised that they actually can co-occur. And that opened the door to better research and better support. How common is co-occurrence? Some meta-analyses suggest around 38-40% to 40 of autistic people also meet the criteria for ADHD. Other clinical samples report much higher. The exact figure varies with age, method and who gets referred but the overlap is clearly much higher than chance. So, ADHD isn't a trend word. It describes a real, measurable overlap that clinicians once weren't allowed to name. So brain dynamics and how networks talk to each other. Think of your brain like three big teams constantly passing the ball back and forth. You've got the default mode network, the daydream team. It's active when your mind wanders. You're lost in thought or thinking about yourself. And then the salience network is like the referee. This decides what's important and when you should switch between daydreaming and focusing on the outside world. And then lastly, you've got the central executive network. And this is the task team. This handles everything from working memory, problem solving and planning. So together, these three form what scientists call the triple network model. Now in ADHD, the daydream team doesn't quiet down properly when the task team needs to focus. That's why attention can feel leaky, like trying to concentrate with background chatter that you can't quite turn off. In autism, the daydream team also shows unusual patterns, especially in how it connects to social thinking and flexibility. The details vary from person to person, but differences in the daydream team show up again and again in research. So what about when autism and ADHD show up together? When researchers look at the brains of people with ADHD, they don't just see autism and ADHD together. The wiring shows its own unique pattern. Some studies actually find changes in the daydream team and in how the referee decides what's important and when to switch. Other research shows the flow of signals between the three main networks, the daydream team, the referee and the task team, can actually look different in ADHD compared to autism only or ADHD only. In other words, ADHD brains don't simply copy either condition. They often create a completely distinct profile of their own. That's why two ADHD people can look completely different. It really depends on which networks are most affected in their brain. So what this might feel like in real life. So if your referee, that's the salience network, struggles to pick a channel, you might feel constantly pulled between tasks, people and sensations. And then if your daydream team, which is the default mode network, doesn't switch off properly, your focus shatters under stress, even when you want to concentrate. And then last, the task team, the central executive network. If your task team isn't firing smoothly when you're tired or overstimulated, planning and transitions can feel like wading through treacle. And here's the key. None of this means that you're weak, lazy or broken. It's simply how your brain's communication system is wired. So now on to the neurochemistry and the EI balance. So there are two main chemistry stories that matter here. Your first one is dopamine and adrenaline. 
Now, this is often linked to ADHD. Research has shown for decades that ADHD brains handle certain chemicals in their brain differently, especially dopamine, which is tied to motivation, reward, and focus. And this is why stimulant medications can help people with ADHD. It can help them feel more alert and organized. Now, scientists see the picture now as more complex than the old dopamine hypothesis, but the core idea still stands. Differences in dopamine and related chemicals play a role in ADHD traits. And now the EI balance, excitation and inhibition. This is often linked to autism. So this big theory looks at the balance between two other chemicals, glutamate, which excites and activates brain cells, and GABA, which calms them down. In autism, some studies suggest that these balances can be tilted with too much go and not enough slow down. The result of this, sounds, lights, and social input can feel overly intense. The research is mixed, but it's a useful way to understand sensory overload. Now on to ADHD. These two stories can collide. If dopamine differences make you seek stimulation and your sensory system struggles to turn the volume down, you can end up craving and overwhelmed by the same situation at the same time. That paradox isn't you being inconsistent. It's two brain systems pulling in different directions. And sensory studies support this. Unusual sensory processing shows up in around 40 to 88% of autistic children and around half of children with ADHD. When both conditions are present, sensory linked emotional struggles can be even stronger. So let's talk about genetics. Why autism and ADHD so often travel together. For years, family and twin studies have suggested that there's a link between autism and ADHD. Modern tools like the genome-wide association studies have helped to confirm this and even measure how strong the link is. Using huge data sets, some researchers have found a genetic correlation between ADHD and autism of about 0.36 and sometimes even higher. In a Danish study, it was 0.4 to 0.5. And that means lots of the same genetic variants influence both conditions. When scientists calculate what's called a polygenic score, basically the sum of thousands of tiny genetic risks that you carry, people with both autism and ADHD usually carry a double load of risk variants. One set is linked to autism and one set linked to ADHD. This also supports the idea that ADHD isn't just a label overlap, but often reflects a stacked genetic influence. Newer papers go even further. They show that some genetic pathways are shared between autism and ADHD, but others are different. For example, autism may be more linked to synaptic and developmental genes, while ADHD connects more strongly to dopamine and brain development genes. This helps to explain why there are similarities and differences in the way our brain functions. Put simply, ADHD tends to run in families not because anyone copies behaviours, but because the same underlying genetic pattern can nudge brain development in overlapping ways. Of course, genes aren't destiny. Your environment, support systems and strategies still make a massive difference. But it does explain why many families recognise things in themselves when they hear about autism, ADHD or both. And lastly, it's really important just to note that even though your environment, support systems and strategies can make a difference to your brain development, you are born with ADHD or autism. This just may influence the way that the traits come out. Now let's take all that science and map it onto real life. So the push pull of motivation and meltdown. ADHD differences in dopamine can create a powerful drive for novelty, momentum and social buzz. And then autism differences in the brain networks and chemical balance can make routine and sensory safety essential. Together, it feels like your brain wants to go fast and slow down at the same time, which obviously isn't really possible, but then I'm living with it every day, so. You're not flaky. Your referee network is just struggling to juggle two strong demands. So something that might help you that I have tried, try working in time boxed bursts, followed by planned decompression. 
That could be a noise-free break, dim lights, stim tools, or simply quiet alone time. And remember that this isn't indulgence. This is essential for your brain. Next, what about executive functioning that changes with context? The front part of your brain, which is responsible for planning and control, doesn't work the same way all the time. So sleep, hormones, stress and noise can change how well that functions. You're not inconsistent. Your brain's switching system is sensitive. So what might help with this? Write things down. Planners, alarms, sticky notes, etc. And on that note, make sure that they are easily accessible so that it's easy to go to them when you think of the thing. There are also some apps out there that might help with this. Cut down on switching costs. So group similar tasks. Use one inbox and one list. And then build salience cues. So that's like colour coding or sound signals that tell your brain this is important now. Remember, not all these things will work for you and that's okay. It's about figuring out what does work for you. All of our ADHD brains are different. And then sensory systems. When your EI balance is tilted, your sensory budget gets used up quickly. The more noise or input, the less energy is left for patience, focus or planning. So control what you can. So use earplugs, sunglasses, soft fabrics if that helps. Even escape corners like sitting in the car for a breather, shopping online, click and collect. Sensory tools aren't luxuries. These are assistive tech for your nervous system. Let's move on to medication. Research actually suggests that autistic adults that also have ADHD often see better outcomes with ADHD medication overall, but responses can vary. So some stimulants may be helpful. Some people don't find them helpful at all. Some people find that they increase anxiety or sensory sensitivity. The key here is to work with a clinician who understands both autism and ADHD. Lastly, identity and self-compassion. Remember that until 2013, doctors weren't even allowed to diagnose ADHD and autism in the same person. So many adults have gone decades without the right label or support. If you're newly diagnosed and grieving the what ifs, that is completely valid. Understanding your brain dynamics can help. It can help you to shift your perspective from why can't I just do the thing to what does my brain need right now? I post a new video most weeks. So if you found this helpful today, make sure you hit subscribe. So let's do a quick recap. ADHD is real and it's common and it's more common than you might think it is. The ADHD brain shows shared and unique patterns across the big three networks. Brain chemistry like dopamine, GABA and glutamate explains the seek and overwhelm paradox. Genetics do show a real overlap, but also distinct biology in autism and ADHD. Day to day, success looks like energy and sensory budgeting, structured sprints and recovery and supports that match your unique brain. If this has helped you, let me know what part rang true and what you want me to dig into next time. I've created some free resources for our brains and I'm coming out with a new one every single week. To find these, just head down below to my stand store and you can find it near the top. And of course, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this and comment down below what things you want me to cover in future videos. I'm Jess, that ADHD mum. Let's make this space make sense for our brains.